And it's a, it's an interesting day today. It's out of the fair day. There's a lot of queer history with cannabis legalization and activism. The AIDS epidemic played a serious role in cannabis legalization and medical cannabis legalization. And Terrence was there. He lived through it. He's there to witness it. He's here today with the cannabis shop in San Francisco. So with that, welcome, Terrence. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Okay, now I know how this works. Yay, San Francisco pop. We love it. We love it. Yep. Woo! My name is Terrence. As, as Brian has introduced me, I met Dennis Perone in the 90s when my husband was dying, and I got arrested with him for growing pot in our house. Now, the cops were so stupid. A little side story, then I'll let you go ahead. But a little side, the cops were so stupid that they could not find the grow in my house. Two hours, now my husband like died three months later. He's on the ground in handcuffs. I'm on the ground in handcuffs. We're finally like, how are we gonna end this criminality? And I showed them my clone closet, which was behind a painting and in that was about, I don't know, 28 little starts, and that was what they got. And on their way out, they pointed at me and they said, we know you're part of Dennis Perone's gay pot mafia, and we're gonna get you. And so that was a badge of honor, and the, Dennis had just passed Prop P, which made enforcement the lowest priority I, like Brownie Mary, took community service. My husband died in the meantime, so it was just all on me. And I took community service and skirted through that whole period of time. And it made me even more ferociously a cannabis warrior. Because at that time, I thought, I made it through this period. Who couldn't make it through because Dennis Perone wasn't knocking on their door saying, I will help you. And so we expanded the movement. Dennis opened on Market Street. And after Prop 215, I joined a group of people and we formed CHAMP, Californians Helping Alleviate Medical Problems, CHAMP. And why should you know CHAMP? Because CHAMP is the reason if you are a medical patient, you do not pay tax on sales tax on your cannabis. Champ was sued, yeah. Champ was sued, Champ stood up, Champ fought back, and Champ won, and it was declared exempt from sales tax. So that's my little side story. Go ahead, Brian. What do you want? What are we gonna talk about today? Well, I kind of want to start with San Francisco and the okay. Bay Area and why. You know, and how that became a center of activism, specifically for human uh, rights, but cannabis legalization. Mm -hmm. um, and how long, how long have you been living in the Bay? And how would you describe the atmosphere, let's just say like in the 70s, if you had, were there in that time? The 70s were a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> I was from Chicago. I moved when I could to San Francisco to find my gay family, and I found that there were tens of thousands of people like me who had come from all over the world to San Francisco to make not only gay family, gay community, but as you heard if you were listening to John, gay politics. And it was gay politics that stuck. And Harvey Milk told us Go get a job in City Hall. Yeah, run for office if you want, but that's really difficult and a pain in the ass. Go get a bureaucratic job in City Hall. And so by the 80s, City Hall was com almost completely staffed. More than 50% of the staff in City Hall was gay, LB LGBTQ+. It was amazing. And so when I got arrested and went into City Hall, all of my family were there. How do we make this easy for you? And that's what happened in San Francisco. And it didn't happen, it happened at first for really fun reasons. Then Harvey Milk got killed, the tenor changed, the gay community showed its first, I won't call it violent, but its first streak of anger that resulted in police cars being burned in front of City Hall and a riot when Harvey Milk was killed. 
Now, we all know the story of Harvey Milk. If you, ha if you don't, watch the movie. It's way better than I could tell it. But that changed the tenor of San Francisco. And from that point on, we realized that it wasn't going to be a fun road forward. It was going to be a fight forward. And the minute that changed in our head, AIDS hit. And now we had two fights. We were fighting for cannabis, and we were fighting to live. And I am one of those really lucky guys um, in my late 60s, and I made it through by about two months. Protease inhibitors came out right as my health was starting to tank. And like magic, those drugs stopped the progression of HIV, and I am here today looking as healthy as anybody in the room. And that was an amazing feat. I had nothing to do with it, but I'm here today because all of those people fought. And, you know, remember, Reagan is in the White House. His best friend was dying of AIDS, and he left office without even mentioning the word. That was the political climate we were in. San Francisco, very different. We were fighting every day to keep our friends alive and keep the dignity in their death as they were dying. What I discovered was how to grow pot. I met a farmer from Humboldt in 1981 on the beach in Mexico on vacation in January. And we were, I was like, I want to party and I go to the beach and I'm collecting people and we're going to party and one of them is a pot farmer and one of them is a crazy pot farmer's helper, like crazy pot farmer's helper, who is way fun. We have a party, we become friends, he's a Vietnam War vet like Dennis and he taught me how to grow cannabis. Now remember, cannabis was all grown in Humboldt County by hiding the plants next to a redwood tree scattered all around the hills, facing south, looking for a stream or a spring, running black tubing down, digging a hole, putting miracle Grow, planting the pot, planting hundreds of these all around, and hoping that about 35 or 50 would make it through the camp days. And that was how cannabis culture started, I believe, because the intersection of the Vietnam War, the vets coming back with seeds, Afghani seeds in their pockets. They started the California, Northern California Emerald Triangle movement for growing cannabis because they came home, they did not fit in. If they weren't gay, they probably left San Francisco because it was quite a gay town at that point if you were in cannabis. And they would move up to Mendocino, they moved to Sonoma, they moved to Lake County, but the majority went to Humboldt. And that collective of people created what I believe is the cannabis cultivation movement in California. And I learned from them, and because I was a city rat, I hated the two hour drive, no, pardon me, four and a half hour drive from San Francisco to Humboldt where I had a farm that I had to go to twice a week in order to tend my crops. So I love San Francisco, I drove back down, I drove up there, we watered for a day, I came back, we partied, I went back there. It was, it was a fun time, but it was unsustainable for me. And so we've got people dying, we've got people growing, we have people like me that are making this trek back and forth, and then suddenly lights, big ass, six foot round lights with bulbs that drop down, high pressure sodium bulbs that came down in the middle, big noisy vibrating transformers, and we got two of those, rented a derelict house in Whitethorn, California, and planted indoors. The, I think the first indoor cultivation probably ever in Humboldt County. It, did not work. We did not understand you needed to have air come in and out. And so about one month into it, everything is going bonkers. The weed is getting moldy. We couldn't figure it out. It took about three death crops to finally get it right. When we got it right, I said, no more driving. I'm going to grow in San Francisco. And I found a warehouse. 
I got two lights. I grew my first two pounds, a pound of light, which was really good back then. And I got $5,600 a pound. $5,600. It paid my rent for a year, paid our expenses for a year. And I'm like, holy shit, this is awesome. We can live, we can have a good time and grow pot. Then people are dying. How do you grow pot when people are dying? Well, to, I'm going to shut up in a minute. To allow them to live in their apartments and die with dignity, they would typically, friends of mine, would move into the living room because it was hard to get around. I would take over their bedroom and I would put in two lights. I'd black out the windows. I'd put ventilation up the air shaft. And by doing that, I could pay their rent and their PG&E bill. So over about 10 years, I helped 17 of my friends pay their rent, pay their PG&E, die in dignity in their house by growing pot in their spare bedroom. And it was that that cemented me as the gorilla cannabis grower, and that's what changed my life and really turned my whole life from party and sadness to cannabis and hope because there was that little glimmer of hope. Cannabis was doing something for us. We didn't know what. It was making people who were dying who could not eat. It was making them hungry. Hello, pot, munchies. They would get hungry. They would eat. They would live longer. There was this magical connection. We didn't know what it was, but it was working, and that's what cemented me as not only a grower, but then eventually an AIDS activist, and now I'm lucky enough to have the floor dispensary in the Castro selling primarily humble, sun-grown weed. That's the story. I'm shutting up. Thank you. Thank you. No, don't, don't shut up, please. So taking a step back to the 70s, you know, Whistle describes cannabis and kind of the role of cannabis in the 70s as kind of the flag of freedom. This is pre-HIV AIDS, yep. but it is a symbol for marginalized communities in some way in the city, right? Is that the same way you saw it? How did you see cannabis and the role of cannabis in the 70s prior to the epidemic? Cannabis gave us the freedom to be able to work hard in the field or work hard cultivating or work hard trimming and then live our life without having a job. And it replaced work for those of us that are really not job people. Uh, you know, going, punching a clock. I don't know that I could do that. And so cannabis was my way out of that life. And it was the way out of that life for hundreds of people. People that would come from all over the country and hitchhike up to Humboldt during harvest season to trim for two months. And they would make enough money to live for months and go back to their homes and go through the same process over and over. So cannabis became an economic engine as well for people as for politics. You heard, if you were here when John was talking, you heard about the connection between the early politicians in San Francisco. Cannabis helped them get elected because those bags of cash bought lots of advertisements. And it was that that helped fuel things. So there was this connection in the 70s. That connection changed from politics to health as we learned that we were dying. We didn't know what was going on. But it turned from politics to health because now our energy was in trying to keep people alive. So we took money from cannabis. We took the influence from cannabis. And we started pressuring the government through ACT UP, and other AIDS activist organizations, they were all fueled by cannabis money. It's not written down, nobody really knows it, it was all cash, but those organizations were fueled by cannabis money. In fact, Petrellis had one of the first dispensaries on Market Street, and he was one of the f most ferocious, and still is alive, one of the most ferocious cannabis activists going into state building with bags of blood and throwing it on the ground in the city and the state offices and everybody would do a die in on the floor. In the midst of blood, on the rugs, in the Capitol building, that was, that was the state of activism in the late 70s and the late 80s as a result of this intersection of cannabis which allowed us to be who we were. We didn't have to go 
every day into work so we could organize, we could meet, we could party, we could figure out what to do. If we had to go to Sacramento, if we got arrested, we didn't lose our job. We were protected by our cannabis family and our queer family. That's 70s and 80, early 80s. Yeah, and I remember Dennis sharing that Moscone, Harvey Milk, and him, it was very much you know, allies and strategy together. Absolutely. And that cannabis cash that helped support Harvey's election and yep. all of it being intertwined. Now, as we get into the 80s, you know, right in the heart of the Castro, it's the height, you know, HIV AIDS comes in and Cafe Floor is a community uh, gathering place. And that's where Dennis Perone and Brownie Mary met. Yep. And if you could share, what was the atmosphere like in the early days of experimenting and trying to figure out how to even approach what, what the unknown was, and, and, and can you just share what that was like at Cafe Floor as people tried to navigate? Um, I don't know that it is, I have the ability, the oratory ability, I don't know that I have the words to describe what it was like on the Cafe Floor patio in the late 70s and early 80s. It was a place that was not known as a LGBTQ, back then we were all gay and queer. It was not a queer cafe. It was a cafe where crazy people went. People with spiked hair, with mohawks. Everybody was dressed to the nines. And it was a place where you hung out and found your afternoon mate or found your lifetime husband and wife. And that was what went on at Cafe Floor. Now, you know, we've got, we're human. Even when you're gay, you're human. And this need to have sexual experiences drove us into very dangerous situations with HIV, but drove us to congregate at the one place in the Castro that we felt was safe. And because of that, the cannabis community started to hang out there as well. And it was on the patio that Prop 215 started to be born. And so thanks to Brian, there will soon be a, a memorial there for Brownie Mary and Dennis Perone to memorialize that spot in the Castro, which at that point was, uh, there's, there's really no words. I mean, if you can imagine everybody in this room looking absolutely counterculture, Piercings, tattoos, spiked hair, shaved heads, you name it, everyone in the cafe floor looked that way. And there was a hole in the wall of the cafe that connected to the Finnish bathhouse next door. So it was the perfect place to meet and go for your afternoon relationship and to hang out. And so it was the busiest place. And it was where everyone came. It was world renowned. In fact, there is a cafe floor in Paris, France, because the people in Paris came, that was, they were so turned on. Cafe floor in Paris will be 48 years old this year. Cafe floor in San Francisco will be 50 years old this year. And it was that whole connection, that whole time, and you know, overlay with that the tragedy of all of your friends dying, and it really drove us to be close together. There is nothing like sorrow to drive you close to your friends. And I remember Dennis, you know, and John sharing about how just meeting and sharing information as a community, especially in the early days, because no one knew how to treat it. There was these experimental drugs coming out that would make you blind and you know, and it was literally just guinea pigs on the front lines trying to figure this out as a community, which I felt was a pretty powerful story when I heard it. Yep. Um, did you experience any of that, of the community just kind of really, what's the latest thing out, who has it, reporting back? There was, before there was chat rooms and before there was an internet, you had to physically get in a room with people that were doing things like what you wanted to do. And it was at Cafe Floor that you learned about the latest drug therapy. Of course, none of them worked. I remember spending $600 a month, which in 1982 is probably $6,000 a month today. 
but $600 a month, we would send a money order to Berlin, Germany, and get a vial of God knows what it was, and inject it in ourselves because that was the latest cure for HIV and AIDS. And that was our hope. There was, there was no medical treatment. There was no real anything going on. And it was at that cafe that we learned about all those alternative therapies. We were the guinea pigs. We subjected ourselves to it. None of it worked. But you know what? When you are sacrificing that kind of money, when you're waiting for that parcel to come in the mail, and when you're sticking it in your arm, I think that that has a placebo effect. And I think it helped some of us live longer. So, and then the cannabis shows up. Oh, yeah. And the first, and of course, the big story is the munchies, you know, now it's an appetite stimulant saving lives. What about other therapeutic um, solutions or easement of suffering did you see? You know, was there other symptoms or, or things that patients struggled with that had HIV AIDS, aside from appetite and wasting syndrome and addressing that? Did you see cannabis work in other ways? And if so, how? How many people that can hear my voice have ever been stoned? Raise your hand. All right. So you know when you get stoned, it changes your head. It can, if you have the right experience with the right cannabis, it can take you out of your body momentarily. And when you go out of your body and your body is dying, your soul is still alive. You know, kind of draw that correlation. When, you, when, when I read about kind of the, the jazz years, right, like in the 1930s, and these musicians that were performing in these extremely racially charged environments, you know, aside from using cannabis as a tool for composition, also it was a way to kind of soften the tension of that racial do you think that you know as, as a marginalized community the lgbtq community did you see cannabis working in that way do you think that that community used cannabis not just as a flag of freedom on the front lines of the epidemic but do you think it was a way to soften kind of that existence of kind of having to you know process that kind of criminalizing love and sexuality yeah. and marriage and all these milestones that are innately human and are built into you that are now against the law, wrong, not accepted, not normal. And do you think that the, that the queer community used cannabis similar to the African-American community in the 1930s? Don't bogart that joint. Don't bogart that joint. Have you ever heard that? Don't bogart that joint. In other words, pass it along pass it around. And when you take a joint and you pass it around, you build friends. And it was that friendship making potential that cannabis added along with feeling better, getting your mind out of the moment, doing all those good things. But then as you're passing it around, you're like, oh, what's your name? Oh, you're fun. Okay, let's hang out. And it formed a new community that you would never have formed before. And it was all about don't bogart the joint. Now, today, bogart the joint because you don't know what the, you know if you're going to get the B5 or whatever B10 is going around. So bogart the joint today, but back then, don't bogart the joint brought us closer together. And that's something that unless you were there, I don't think, I don't know that anybody's talking about that phenomena, that it really does help social interaction. Social lubricant, I guess it would be, yeah. So today you have a cannabis shop in San Francisco in the Castro where a lot of this history is. Can you share a bit more about the monument and the mural that was created, which is really an attraction now in San Francisco, and it honors some of the history you're talking about. Can you share a little bit about what that is, what inspired you to create it in a little deeper way? And yeah. I'm going to go backwards. So you said what inspired you to create the mural? I could not get my neighbors to stop yelling at me about opening a cannabis store in the neighborhood. And I sought ways to influence them, I can't say bribe them, influence their opinion of me and my idea by promising to do good things for the community. And one of the things that I promised to do was to create a 40 foot long 
16 foot high mural on the side of my building that faces a garden so you can see it from the whole neighborhood on the side of my building and I wanted to tell this very special story about my friends in Humboldt who would go down with their pounds of pot to Dennis, just like I would, go down and Dennis would say, okay, so what are you going to give me? Well, I'm here to sell my pot. No, what are you going to give me? Because people, he would buy pot and then he would twist your arm. And John, if you're around, he was the worst fucking arm twister, man. When I would go in there, I would wait in the background and watch for him to get busy so that I could talk to Dennis because Dennis was an easy mark. We love you, Dennis. But every time Dennis would buy a five pounds of pot, he would ask for a pound for free. And it was that pound for free that created what I call this non-church tithing program that today we call compassionate cannabis. Compassionate cannabis is where farmers, producers, and now retail stores all get together and give cannabis to people who cannot afford to buy it. Back then, all you had to do was walk in and go to Dennis and go, I don't have any money, and he would slip you an eighth of pot. But it was that beginning, that tithing, that tied the two communities together in this really strange way. Farmers that were Vietnam War vets that were straight as an arrow up in Humboldt County meeting all these queer people on Market Street with thousands of queer people, lots of them dying in this building. They're walking in this building. It's changing their impression of the world, and they're being asked to give pot so that he can give it away. Who could say no to that? And that's what was going on. I don't know what your question was, but that's my answer. <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, today a big part of the industry is this discussion around equity and social equity in marginalized groups and people impacted by the war on drugs which really runs across different communities and audiences. And, you know, you're an equity license holder, correct, in the yeah. city. Yeah. So can you share a little bit about your definition of what you think equity is today and the social equity programs in the cannabis industry in California and what you would like to see happen um, and what it is? So in my little world, equity in cannabis means that you got screwed by law enforcement because you were involved in cannabis. You got arrested, you had something taken away, you had your liberty taken away, you spent time in jail, and as a result of being arrested, you were denied employment. You couldn't go to work at the majority of places because you had a cannabis arrest and conviction on your record. And that is what birthed the equity movement because collective community guilt we all felt really guilty, those of us that got through it and those people that were on the outside. We felt really guilty for all those warriors who had gone to jail, who had had their lives, sometimes their families, completely ruined or taken away from them, sometimes child protective services. Bang, bang, bang on the door. We're coming for your kid because you're a pot farmer. Bam, they take your kid. No defense. And suddenly, your entire life is turned upside down because of your devotion to cannabis. And it was those people who the Cannabis Equity Program is designed to help and give a leg up. Now, that's the bright side of the equity programs in California, helping people that got screwed. The dark side is that the equity program has been created by politicians. And as much as I love politics, the equity programs, especially that in San Francisco, is a big setup for the equity community. If you are not already in business, if you are not already open, if you're going to be one of the later people that open, you're going to have a really hard time making it. Because suddenly we went from seven, ten, well, we had two, we had one, then we had two dispensaries, and then we had seven, and then we had eight, and then we had 18, and we had 18 or 20 for about five years, and everybody bought pot from those 18 or 20. You'd go in, you'd stick your head in the turkey bag, you'd go, I want that one. You'd buy your pot, and those 18 or 20 stores 
not only gave away a lot of pot, they, but they made a hell of a lot of money. And the politicians looked at that and they said, we want some of that. We're going to tax you, we're going to organize your business, we're going to segment it into various categories, and then we're going to make it possible for everyone that was hurt by cannabis enforcement to be part of the industry. But guess what? There's no profit in it anymore. So those cannabis equity applicants are again being screwed by the political system. And it's unfortunate. Um, there are not many people talking about it. I talk about it because I opened a store six months ago and I know how hard it is. I haven't, I, I'm not gonna get to break even for a year. And I've got a fortunately fairly well off farmer helping me get through. If I were a straight equity applicant, I would have had to close my doors. I would have risked everything in my life. I would have spent all my family's money. I would have gone through not six months, not a year, not 18 months, but on average two to three years of waiting, paying rent, having my application in, trying to raise money, and then open my store. When there are not 18 or 20 stores, there will be 150 stores in San Francisco. So divide the amount of money that went to those 20 stores by 150, and you know how screwed all of those stores are going to be. Unless they turn into Ford, Chevrolet, General Motors, Tesla, that's the only way they're gonna survive. So tell us about your shop in San Francisco. What would people experience today when they walk in? Humboldt. If you walk into my store, you will experience Humboldt. You will walk in, you'll open the door, and you'll be hit by a redwood tree that my partner cut down in the woods and we brought down on his trailer and we stuck in the middle of the store. You'll look down at the floor, you'll see 100% organic hemp floors, 100% organic hemp cabinets. You'll see that a Sonoma cannabis farmer built all of my display shelves. You will not see anything commercial in that store. You'll see a redwood, piles of redwood, four by fours on the back wall. You'll see a mural. You'll see fresh dried flowers. That's what you'll see in my store. Nothing like it anywhere else that I've ever been. What about the products? What kind of products do you carry and why? So we carry two kinds of products. I call them Humboldt, Emerald Triangle, Small Farm, Legacy Farm products. That's our primary goal. My goal, Sun Grown. Um, yeah, Sun Grown. Let's hear it for Sun Grown, yep. Save the planet, stop PG&E bills, get it in the sunshine, sun grown. Now, we're at a moment in history where indoor drives the market. And so we have a combination of Humboldt and Emerald Triangle Farms. Shasta, we have one farm in Shasta. We love the farm in Shasta. Um, their water is so damn cold that the pot is black. And if you haven't seen that, you can come and I'll give you my card and you can come and take a look and a smell. But anyhow, so we have small batch farms and we have commercial weed. Why? Because I've got to bring people in. And I train my staff so that when somebody comes in and they're looking for Stizzy, I say, guess what? There are options that are better than Stizzy. Why don't you try them out? And that's how my store is run. And that's my ethos. And that's what I'm trying to do is to continue this Humboldt and small farm connection and cannabis and San Francisco community through this big, massive industry change that Prop 64 created and this huge extinction event from 15,000 Humboldt Prop 15 farms this year, there are 1,500 farms, and my partner up in Humboldt who does cannabis licensing says that only 40% of them, so about 700, 650 farms, are still in operation. So Prop 64, 15,000 farms, we're down to 650. So 
everything we can do to save those farms and to keep the message out there. Because guess what? Craft beer came after Heineken's and Coors and all those big brands wiped out the craft beer industry. We had a vibrant craft beer industry in the 40s in San Francisco. We had 45 craft breweries in San Francisco alone. And they all got wiped out. And then guess what happened 15, 20 years ago? Ooh, something new. Craft beer. Let's make craft beer. And everybody forgot that craft beer was already there. Craft beer is now a thing. But guess what? None of those craft breweries, none of those beer makers are alive today making beer. And I don't want that to happen with cannabis. I don't want big cannabis to wipe all of the craft cannabis people off the map. And then 20 years from now, everybody wakes up and goes, oh, we want craft cannabis. We want small batch farms. We want legacy, humble, sun-grown. And by then it'll be too late. We'll all be retired or dead. <laughs> And there won't be that tradition to carry on to the next generation, and it'll start all over. So single-handedly, we're going to change that with your help. So come support small farmers. Yay! Yes! Yay! Squirrel farms. Yes! <laughs> so I have uh, two more questions for you. Yeah, yeah. One is, you know, the cannabis legalization movement is in many ways a human rights movement, a patient access movement. Yep. How do you, as this new industry unfolds, you know, the, you know, compassion, right? The values, sustainability, regeneration. How is that brought forward into the new industry? How do we usher in that mindset, that value, that ethos for people that are now attracted to cannabis and the cannabis industry today for different reasons with a different value set? What does that look like? Your money decides the future. If you and your friends and all, everybody on your social network stops buying commercial weed, guess what will happen? Commercial weed will go out of business and small farms will thrive. We have the power. We must take that power in the marketplace and make a decision as to who's going to survive this extinction event. We're only a couple years into legalization. We've gone from 15,000 farms to 700 farms. That's horrible. The only way to save those 700 farms is to buy their weed. And that's what we have to do. And guess what? That's an activist principle. You, you went to Cafe Floor because it was friendly to the alternative community. You went to the businesses that were friendly to the alternative community. You spent your money and you put your money on the line supporting businesses that supported you. And that's how we're going to get through this period of time. Um, there's got to be like a hundred of me and, and Brian's going around and telling this story and teaching our young cannabis consumers that their money talks. Yeah. Don't buy, you know, big farm weed out of God knows where it comes in Southern California. No, 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 I'm not going to name any names. But your money makes those decisions for the future. And so if you tell all your friends, just buy cannabis from small farms, guess who's going to survive? Small farms. So that's how our power in the gay community. We, we learned that, and we're, those of us that are still around, we're trying to teach everybody that that's how we're going to get through this with still a few of our legacy farmers at our side. Yeah, and I think cannabis is an industry, the conscious consumerism, whether it's hemp packaging, whether it's veterans, whether it's children with epilepsy, seizures, whether it's the LGBTQ community, BIPOC communities, the packaging, the labeling, the, the stories on the websites, you see it. When you start peeling back the layers, you'll see that it's very much this kind of human rights movement, people with a purpose, um, and, and hopefully we'll see kind of that evolve you know, consumerism in general to knowing who owns this brand, how do they operate, yep. what are their practices, and why does it matter so we can all be a little more connected in that way. What about the future? Five, ten years from now, hemp and cannabis are now integrating into mainstream culture, right? They're coming out of the shadows, into the light. Hemp is the most powerful renewable resource on, resource on earth, arguably. You have, you, have, you have consciousness being involved with cannabis, used in a very mindful way with intention. 
in five to ten years from now, what is the highest expression of cannabis and hemp integrating and moving kind of evolution forward and the world forward? What do you see? What would you like to see? Everybody have a hemp floor in their house made from organic pressed together hemp. Everybody spend your money on hemp and cannabis products. That's how, that's how we'll make this change. What do I see happening? It ain't pretty. So I don't know if I want to you know, spoil all your buzzes Highest here. expression. Highest expression. Highest expression? Yeah, not what you predict. What would you, what would, what do you, what's your vision? What would you like to see if you could? Oh, what would I like to see is different from what's going to happen if we don't do something starting today. Well, oh. hold that thought. Okay. We'll get back to it. A little interruption. Yay, fireworks. Oh, man. Cannabis farmers love fireworks. <laughs> um, so, okay, so highest expression. What would, you, what would you like to see hemp and cannabis, the impact in five to ten years globally on society? Replace all of the plastic with hemp and plant-derived products that biodegrade and don't kill off the ocean. I don't know if anybody in this room knows, but there was a study done a couple of months ago in Scotland to measure how much plankton is in the Atlantic Ocean. And guess what? There's not much left. And plankton is being killed off by plastic. So we've got to switch. We've got to switch today. We've got to switch immediately. My highest and best future is you guys spending your money on products that support continuation of the planet. Hemp-based cannabis packaging, hemp-based paper, all of the products that can replace those bleached and plastic things that never degrade, all of those products that support us and support the planet in the future. That's my highest and best vision. Um, and it's, it's only going to happen if we do it. So, you know, there's, what, 20 of us here? We can create a revolution. There were less than 20 of us in the room when we started all this, so we can create the revolution. Go out and tell everybody, don't buy anything if it has plastic on it. Wonderful, Terrence. Are there any other last comments or parting words or things you'd like to remind people, where they can find you maybe, your website, anything oh. before we wrap it here? Okay, if you're in San Francisco or going to San Francisco, I have a four-bedroom bud and breakfast. Yes, a bud and breakfast directly above the dispensary. The name of the dispensary is Flore, F-L-O-R-E, meaning flower in French, Flore dispensary. It's all purple, because my favorite bud is purple. The whole building is purple. You'll love it, you'll love the products. Come, look at the website, floredispensary.com and you'll find out everything that we're doing. And if you want to really know how this all got started, come on a Friday afternoon and hang out with myself, my partner, Dr. Jean Talleyrand, and we'll talk about the history and the future of cannabis together. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here, Terrence. And when you visit his shop too, you can see that mural. Oh yeah, the mural. Which is a monument on the cannabis trail. Also a dedicated landmark that lives in that shop. So it's, it's an amazing space that Terrence has built. Thank you guys all for sitting and listening. And Terrence, thanks again for being here. Appreciate it. And thank you. you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody. Get my card and let's keep connecting, okay? <laughs> <laughs>